Hello you, hello everyone. Let us begin this class with the prayer. We'll sign ourselves in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, who before it ascending into heaven, did promise to send the Holy Spirit to finish your work in the souls of your apostles and disciples. Deign to grant the same Holy Spirit to me, that he may perfect in my soul the work of your grace and your love. Grant me the spirit of wisdom, that I may despise the perishable things of this world and aspire only after the things that are eternal, the spirit of understanding, to enlighten my mind with the light of your divine truth. The spirit of counsel, that I may ever choose the surest way of pleasing God and gaining heaven. The spirit of fortitude, that I may bear my cross with you and that I may overcome with courage all the obstacles that oppose my salvation. The spirit of knowledge, that I may know God and know myself and grow perfect in the science of the saints. The spirit of piety, that I might find the service of God sweet and amiable. The spirit of fear, that I may be filled with a loving reverence towards God and may dread in any way to displease him. Mark me, dear Lord, with the sign of your true disciples and animate me in all things with your spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening and welcome to our class today. We will be doing the Gospel of John and we'll be introduced to this personality John but more importantly John will introduce us to the personality of Jesus as you can see in your screen you can see the word the Gospels and we know that the Gospels are in the New Testament yes there are four Gospels Matthew Mark Luke and John and those are lovely pictures of them well there are only four that are in our Bible Though there were many Gospels, four were chosen to be put in our Bible. So the first one to be written is by Mark. Mark wrote his Gospel around 65 to 68. That's about 35 years after Jesus. And each Gospel writer is writing for a specific audience. And Mark wants to present Jesus because his audience was suffering at that time, the persecutions. He wants to present Jesus to the early Christians as the suffering Messiah. So Mark presents that part of Jesus so that they understand that Jesus too suffered. Now Matthew. Matthew was a thorough Jew. Okay. And he is writing, his audience is the Jews. He wrote it, as you can see, around AD, the 80s, 50 years after Jesus. And as I told you, his audience was Jews. That is why he is presenting Jesus as the Messiah, because all the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. And Matthew wants to tell them that the Messiah is Jesus. He wants to, he'll present Jesus as greater than Moses, because for them, Moses was the greatest prophet. He will be showing them that Jesus is even greater than Abraham and he wants to present that Jesus to the Jews. That is why Matthew will start his uh, gospel with a genealogy because for Jews a genealogy is very very important you know who is the, the family tree. So Matthew will begin that to trace Jesus's genealogy to David and right up to Abraham because he wants to show that Jesus comes from because they believe that the Messiah would come from the line of David. 
Well, let's take Luke. Luke, as we can see, wrote it nearly the same time as Matthew, all right, around that time. But Luke was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, that means a non-Jew. And as you can see in your picture, he was a doctor, Dr. Luke. All right. And uh, Luke's audience for the Greeks. That is why he will be writing a little higher. The early Christians also. So he is going to present Jesus as the compassionate Jesus. Luke will be actually talking about the poor, the Holy Spirit. He'll be talking about women. He will mention about women playing their part. You know, the Jews wouldn't bother, but the, for the Greeks, you know, women did play an important role. And Luke brings that part of Jesus out, right? And uh, that's, you know, how we know he's a doctor. Because when he talks about, you know, that uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, whose ear was cut off, he will mention it is the right ear. He will mention this person just died. Because he's writing his gospel accordingly like a doctor. He was a physician. And he gets most of his uh, source. His source was Paul. Gets all his knowledge. He was a traveling companion of Paul. And that's how he learns about Jesus. And he writes his gospel. Not only he writes a gospel, but he also gives us the acts of the apostles. And that's how we come to know that uh, how did the early church, after the death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus, how did the church form and how did it grow? We are thankful to Luke, Dr. Luke. And the last gospel to be written was the gospel according to John. Okay, now John, he wrote his gospel after the 90s, 90, after 90 till 110 AD. They don't know the exact dates, but it was much after. In fact, many people say that John read through those other other ones and uh, you know saw what was missing but if you have read your gospels you will discover that john's gospel is so different okay from the other three that were he is writing of course his gospel to the greeks and the jews but he is going to give you a different view all right he is going to present the person of Jesus. He is going to talk about the divinity of Jesus and his view is totally different. He is going to, that's why, you know, when he, he'll trace Jesus's origins, Matthew and Luke, they begin their gospels with the birth of Jesus. Mark begins with the baptism, but John, he is going to trace the origins to pre-existence. He's going to be uh, tracing uh, Jesus's. He's going to show you exactly the deity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus. All right. So that is the fourth gospel. And that is the gospel that we are going to be touching upon today. Next. Well, as I mentioned, three gospels in the picture, it shows you the three red apples, no? They are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are called synoptics. Because sin means uh, to uh, similar, something similar, no? Uh, okay, synergy, something similar. And optic, of course, we know is to see. The optic nerve, optician, it has something to do with the eyes, to of something to do with seeing. So when we put it together... We will, when we put these three Gospels together, we will see they are all writing with a common view. They are writing about the ministry of Jesus and it's uh, quite similar, all the three of them. Well, as John, John is writing a different kind of view. He is talking, tracing Jesus' origin to the divine. He's going to be writing that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So he is, uh, we will be doing a lot about this uh, gospel of John in the next two classes, this class and the next. So 
let us now learn who is john all right so we will go to the next slide well the gospel of john as we can see let us is written especially to present the deity of jesus he wants to trace jesus back right so when we uh, many times we have seen that eagle that picture even in our church we must have seen it on the lectern and uh, he is uh, depicted as the eagle that is taken from ezekiel 110 where the, each of the gospel writers have got a symbol and john has got the symbol of an eagle that is because his gospel gives us such a overview something so lofty and uh, or something so uh, you know like a an eagle looking from above and that is where he is tracing jesus's uh, origins to the pre existence the deity of jesus all right so that is why many times when we see this eagle in churches and you know, all we should know it represents the evangelist john okay there's mark there's uh, matthew mark has the lion because he comes out starting his gospel like the roaring lion luke has the ox the ox because it's a sacrificial animal and luke presents jesus as the sacrificial uh, victim all right so each one has a different symbol well let me tell you a little bit of john john was one of the apostles this john was one of the apostles of jesus one of the 12 he was a fisherman his brother was james and his father was zebedee you know james and john the father of uh, the whose father was zebedee the sons of zebedee he was one of the you know he uh, gives his title as the disciple that jesus loved because when we will see i know that we say jesus does not favorites but when we will read through the gospels you will see jesus usually is taking peter james and john along with him at the transfiguration they were there he takes them when he has to raise up jairus's daughter he takes them even in the garden of gethsemane these are the last three so this is that disciple john and he is such a good eye witness because he was very much there you know witnessing all this so he can give us such a lovely view of jesus next then john's gospel presents it starts out with saying in the beginning you know when the earth is beginning we tend to think back the whole bible new uh, started genesis the book of genesis starts with the same words in the beginning all right and then it starts about how god created this whole universe in 7 days and now john also is starting his gospel in the beginning he wants to bring to mind that now when jesus comes in he is going to bring in a new creation right so a lot of themes john i told you it's an overview a lofty gospel it is very theological it is very reflective compared to the other synoptics so he will begin and he will trace and call jesus was the word we all know that uh, the world was brought forth was created by god's word he said let there be light and there was light we saw this in the book of genesis god only had to say the word and it happened and john will say in the beginning was the word the word was with god that means jesus was there from the pre existent before the world was created and he says and the word was god now this word uh, word is logos you must have heard this word logos okay and john will be talking in his prologue that this word became flesh this word chose to become flesh become flesh and dwell among us all right he came down this word that we talk is actually the word of god the mind of god and here we can see that the mind of god 
became a person. All right, and that person has come into this speck of planet Earth for a specific reason. All right, he left all his glory behind, and he chose, and he chose to be, uh, you know, contained by space and time, to age and pain, and all these things that we go through. And Jesus came for a purpose, and John will tell you this purpose in his uh, gospel. He will bring it out that he came for the purpose of saving us. He chose us. Okay, he chose to save us. He chose to go through the humility of being a human being. God became man. Okay, he became flesh and he dwelt amongst us. He lived as a human being with us. So we will go on to the next slide. Next slide. Yeah. John's gospel will talk about many uh, themes. I will just not go into the whole thing, but I just want to introduce you. John will talk about life and light. You know, he will talk about life and he will come to the climax. We will see in the end when he will raise someone from the dead, he will give them life. And he talks about light. Uh, we will see this theme a lot in the Gospel of John. Like, you know, whenever he talks about like how Judas went out into the night when he goes to betray Jesus, he will go into the darkness. So uh, uh, even when uh, Lazarus will come out, you know, he will come out from the darkness. Mary Magdalene will come from the darkness. And when she sees Jesus, he's the light. So John will be talking about light. And dark. He wants to present Jesus as the light, the life, all right, of mankind, of all mankind. Next, John talks about a lot of other things. In uh, John 1 17, he will be talking about the law. Remember, he wants to show that Jesus is divine, all right? You've got to believe in Jesus. So he says, Moses gave us the law. Yes, the law came through Moses, but grace came through Jesus. All right. Now, what was the law? The law said, you do and then you're blessed because you have to obey the word of the Lord. You have to obey the law and you're blessed if you obey it. And then you are saved when you're blessed. But something very beautiful. Jesus has come now. He just gives us grace and mercy. It is unmerited, undeserved, and yet he gives it to us. He says, first, you are blessed with grace because I want to give you grace. I, and I can. And when you are blessed, you so want to do something for God because you're feeling so good. And then you do, you do what is right. You follow the law and you are saved. Next slide. Well, in this Gospel of John, we'll be introduced to another John, all right? And that John is John the Baptist. Let's not, uh, let's not uh, confuse the two of them. You well, must have all heard of John the Baptist. He was the cousin of Jesus. We know that he was the baptizer. He was baptizing people in the Jordan. We've heard so much about him. But John, I'm talking with the evangelist John, has written about John the Baptist because at that time when he was writing his gospel, there were heresies, there were wrong beliefs. And they were saying that John the Baptist is greater than Jesus. And John very clearly wants to mention that Jesus is much greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was just a herald. So we will see that even John the Baptist tells others, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist himself says, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. He must increase and I must decrease. So John the Baptist very clearly said he is not the Messiah. And John mentions this. So next slide. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? That is what John is going to. The whole purpose of his writing this gospel 
is to introduce us to the person of Jesus. All the synoptics are telling us about Jesus, but they more concentrate on the kingdom of God. But John is totally going to uh, present the person of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, that he is fully human and also fully divine. But most importantly, he's telling us that he is divine. How he's come to make all things new. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, John is writing his gospel with a purpose. In fact, this whole, uh, what we are going to do today is called the book of signs, which starts right up from chapter 1, verse 19, and it goes on to chapter 12. Well, John's whole gospel has only 21 books in the gospel of John. So you see, this book of signs, as it is called, is uh, has it's taking up nearly such a major part of the gospel because this book of signs is going to reveal to us who Jesus is, the reason to believe in him. Because everything we will be seeing is going to say whether you believe or you unbelieve. And that is why he's going to call this the book of signs. All right, like as you can see, uh, let's take the ch uh, verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 30. It's going to say, and Jesus did many other signs. By the way, John will use the word signs. I will tell you a little ahead. All right. Uh, he did many signs. They're not all written, but these are written so that you may come to believe. All right. And when you believe, the reason to believe in him. And what happens when you believe? You will have life. Well, next. So, John calls the miracles signs. Now, I want you all to pay proper attention because this is one of your questions. Right? Please take down notes. Please take down notes and write down, even if it's little words. John calls his uh, the miracles in his gospel as signs. And he said there were many, but he's written only few, specifically for a reason. He's written only seven. And as right from the beginning of our confirmation classes, we've been telling you seven is the number of perfection. All right. He writes seven signs and all these signs are going to point to something outside. Just like when you are driving a car, no? you see many signs on the road, right? It's telling you how fast to go, where you will turn right where there's no right turn or no U-turn, all these signs are there to point us in the right direction so we go the right way and do obey and do and come to the right place. Exactly what John is talking about here. He's talking about these miracles that are going to talk about something outside, something more something greater than just that spectacular miracle, just that healing, just that uh, whatever. He's going to be talking about something more. So he's going to write about seven signs. And by these signs, he's going to be proving the divinity of Jesus. And it's there for you to believe or unbelieve. We will see. There are people who believe and there are people who don't believe. All right? But the main message that John wants to give in his gospel is in chapter 3, verse 16. Next slide, please. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, that is why he is presenting us with these miracles, these signs, so that we get a chance to come to understand Jesus, know him, and believe in him. Okay? All right? Because we want everlasting life. And that's what he's come to give us, everlasting life. So just imagine what a wonderful God we have because we are loved so much. God loved us so much that he actually sent Jesus down so that we can gain eternal life. Next. Well, so we have come to the book of signs, all right? As I mentioned, I would like you all 
to uh, write down the signs in the order because this is the way chronologically it has been placed in the gospel of john and you will be required to remember them in the order also write the scripture verse that okay it's all john all the seven signs are in the book of signs in the gospel of john so write them please because you will be required to know them in your paper your worksheet right so let's go to the first sign the wedding at cana okay next now this is a very beautiful thing because you know through this sign or miracle uh, we come to know that jesus endorses marriage he endorses the sacrament of marriage because he has taken imagine he's got such a big mission to save the world and he has taken time out to go for a wedding and uh, it's so, so beautiful you know uh, because uh, let's go back to the see any time to know a story we have got to uh, know the background of jesus's time well at jesus's time the bride and the groom were like the king and queen of that for a whole week the wedding would last okay so they uh, and everybody was invited uh, who would come there and there was a lot of wine and here at this wedding jesus has come with his apostles and uh, who was there mary our mother mary and it's a uh, very ironic to see that actually the person serving wine or the family didn't notice that there was no wine it was mary who noticed that they have run out of wine and she goes to her son jesus and says they have no wine that's all she says they have no wine and jesus looks at her and says you know my hour has not yet come now what was this hour that he was talking about the hour is his hour of glory okay when he will complete what he had come for and return back to his glory with the father all right so he says my hour has not yet come but mary as a mother and as someone who cares she just knows her son so well that she says he tells the servant do whatever he tells you you know i i love this because there's a lot when we you know go and pray to mary and ask her to intercede and this is what she tells us do whatever he tells you okay now it's mentioned that there were six stone water jars over there and jesus says fill the jars with water and those servants they just fill them up to the brim now these jars were really big jars they had more than 20 gallons actually of water each one would hold they say sometimes all six of them probably had about 150 gallons of water okay but jesus tells them just fill and those servants they just filled they obeyed there's a nice thing to obey sometimes some orders what are given okay and jesus does his first miracle that is this water he turns this water into wine and we are told that this is the first of his signs well you know his hour may not have come but this definitely got him on the way towards his hour right because now his disciples the people over there you know the, they actually saw this miracle and they started believing him in fact the uh, steward over there the main steward the captain you know when he tasted the wine he says that uh, everybody actually keeps the best for last but here uh, uh, the best wine is always given first sorry and the rubbish wine you know, uh, guests are all drunk then they don't realize the quality of the wine and then they uh, have it they keep it for they keep the rubbish wine for last but here they have kept the best wine for the best wine to give at the end so can you imagine the quality of wine that jesus turned this water into well what was this water jars for next 
you know, these water jars were actually there not to drink the water so much, but for physically, you know, cleaning. And they were for purification. There, and this is what Jesus' miracle is actually going to do. It's going to change. It's going to replace the Jewish purification rites. I like you all to take note of this. Purification rites, these words, okay? Because, you know, the Jews believed they were very clean people. And they were so bothered about cleaning, cleaning, because they were dusty streets and all. They were always bothered about washing their hands and washing their feet. And this, these jars of water was there for cleaning. And Jews believed that they needed to be clean. They needed running water, living water, live. It should be flowing. Okay. So they would keep so much of water that they would pour it in a specific way. It had to be flowing. They would not uh, want to take bath in a basin because that was stagnant water. They wouldn't want to dip their hands just like that in a basin to wash it. They had to have this flowing water. And that water, Jesus is saying, that is not, you know, physical cleansing is of no use without spiritual regeneration. Jesus is going to replace this ritual now and he will give us new wine, new joy. He is going to give us abundance. All right. He is going to give abundance with so much of wine. Just imagine that couple, how happy they were. It would have been an embarrassing situation if at their wedding they run out of wine because all the guests would drink wine and they would drink it and say, like, you know, to cheers for the betterment and the blessing of the couple. So it was so important that they needed wine. Next. And here we will see. Next slide. Marriage is a symbol of Yahweh's relationship with Israel. That is why Jesus endorsed marriage. And uh, it, they know. Okay. And wine, I, as I told you, is a symbol of prosperity, joy, celebration. So wine was so much wanted at their celebrations. Because this would, you know, they would bless the couple, bring joy. And everybody would have a good time. And... Imagine this, they have no wine. Where is the joy? Actually speaking, John is telling them that, you know, this whole joy has gone out of Israel because now they are not following what Yahweh really wants. And here is Jesus to bring back that joy to them. Okay. So next. So this miracle not only talks about abundance, so much he has turned. But this miracle has another theme. It's called a sacramental theme. Okay. There are many sacraments that could be, you know, this could form the basis of one is marriage. The sacrament of marriage, we saw Jesus endorsed it. He actually came for a wedding because he believes in marriage. We see in water. Water is a sign of baptism. So the waters of baptism, okay, will be turned into something so beautiful symbolically. And we will see wine. Well, here Jesus turned water into wine. And two years later, he will turn the wine into his blood. And that is every time we receive Holy Communion at Mass, we are reminded of this theme. So this has a sacramental theme. But what beautifully also it has a Mariological theme. Well, you see, Mary is Jesus' first disciple. She first believed in him. She was the one who just says, do what he says. She believed. And what is something so beautiful is Jesus honors his mother. Just because she asked him, even though his hour had not come, he did it. So she knew he could do it. That is why she asked him. And she knows he loves her so much that he doesn't refuse. That's why we say, you know, true Mary to Jesus. That's why we can ask her to intercede for us. She is our intercessor because being the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, definitely he listens to her so much. Next. Well, I told you it has got a theme of abundance. You know, right from the prophets, 
let's quote the prophet Joel. He says, in that day, when the Messiah comes, there will be abundance of wine. And here we can see this abundance, 100 and nearly 150 gallons. They didn't really need that much. But there was so much because as uh, Jesus says, no, I came to give life and give it to the fullest in John 10.10. 10. Okay. Now, the next one also tells you about the next uh, sign as we are going to will also be uh, quoted by Isaiah by saying that the Messiah will come to heal the sick, give sight to the blind and all that. So let us see the healing of the sick. sick. The next sign. Next slide. Yeah, the second sign is in John chapter 4. It's called the healing of the official son. Next. Well, when we will be reading, I know you all are not going to read, but just at least look at the words that are marked in yellow. All right. I'll tell you a little of this. There is this official, probably an official in the court of uh, Herod, and he's got a lot of status. And uh, his son in Capernaum, now Capernaum is a little distant. And Jesus has come back to Cana and everybody has heard about the miracle at Cana. So even this man has heard this official. And he, though he was such a high status, he had all the best doctors. He must have tried everything, but his son was not well. In fact, he was at the point of death. And this man has traveled from Capernaum to Cana. That is about 20 miles. And he's asking Jesus to come. Come down and heal my son. Come to Capernaum. And Jesus says, you know, all uh, healers in those days had to go and lay their hands. But Jesus, from a distance now, is saying, go, your son will live. Before that, Jesus told them that you'll need to see signs to believe. So now he's giving them a sign. He says, go. And the great thing about this man, this officer, first of all, you know, he calls Jesus, sir. Imagine he is in status. He was higher than the rabbi. But he can see that Jesus is higher and he obeys and he believes and he goes on his way. And while he was going down, his servants met him and told him that your child is all right. And he asked him what time? And they said exactly the time when Jesus had mentioned, go, your son will live. And this man realized that, wow, this is someone great. And he believes. Now, here is John telling us something beyond the miracle. Not only the boy was healed. Okay, many people healed boys. All right. Like Elisha and all, they healed. But here, Jesus is healing from a distance. Okay. In the first miracle, it showed that he was the master of quality, quantity, substance. He could change water into wine. Okay. And the best wine. Here, he's showing that Jesus can heal from a distance. So he is the master of space and distance. Okay. Just he has to say the word and that boy could be healed. So this second sign is telling you the divinity of Jesus because he is greater than just a prophet. He controls space and distance. He can just say a word and that boy can be healed. Next, please. Well, this leads us to the third sign. Okay, now we will see a little bit. So far, we've been seeing belief, belief. Now, in this third sign, we're going to see a little bit of unbelief too. Okay, yeah. Well, the third sign is saying it's a healing at the pool of Bethesda. Now, Bethesda, Bethesda is in Jerusalem and Jesus has come there for the Passover, right? Bethesda means the house of the flowing. Now, why? I, all, I told you about this flowing water. But here, we will see there is a tradition. 
they say that all the sick would line up over there and when the water is stirred that means there's some thing happening the water starts moving they say when angel is stirring the waters and whoever reaches that water first gets healing only one person who reaches first so you can imagine the clamoring to get into that water when it is stirred and here in this miracle is one man who has been paralyzed couldn't walk for 38 years right next slide please and he it is an occasion it's a festival jesus is there this man has been ill he has uh, not walked for 38 years so he sort of accepted this fate of his that uh, it's become his way of life is there and what is the beautiful thing is jesus comes up to him and uh, will say do you want to be healed all right and this man says how can i i can't walk and whenever this stirring happens i have no one to help me so i don't get healed nobody is there to help me self pity he is pitying himself he is not he doesn't realize the healer is standing in front of him he is wondering about the waters that will heal him but the healer says you know jesus always wants to help he said stand up take up your mat and walk jesus is asking him to do for him it is the impossible he says do what you think is impossible get up get out of your comfort zone take up your mat and walk and this man thank god at least he did that he was made well he felt the strength in his legs so he got up and he took up his mat and he began to walk so what was the problem something so beautiful has happened one man for 38 years has suddenly got the power to walk again he will get his livelihood he gets his life back so what was the problem the problem was jesus healed on a sabbath it was a sabbath and for the jews the sabbath was a day of rest okay and they say that it was not lawful for anybody to do work to carry their furniture and here was this man carrying his mat which for him is his bed and that they will say is breaking the law of the rest on the sabbath next slide well as i mentioned he was uh, healed on the sabbath look at what happens this man is questioned by the pharisees all the jewish authorities and they ask him how can you be carrying your mat and he said i don't know there was a man who told me take up your mat and walk and i was walking now instead of focusing on something so beautiful over here when man is healed they've all seen him there they are focusing on that breaking of the sabbath and by the way it is not really breaking of the sabbath because when moses gave them the commandment he said keep holy the sabbath all right that's all but from there they have gone and made it it into so many precepts that you mustn't take so many steps you can't do this you can't do that and jesus wants to change all that right so they ask this man he says i don't know who this man is who healed me but he told me take up my mat and walk and i did that and then later this man sees jesus and jesus tells him that uh, better go and ask for forgiveness of your sins you know i mean you have got because spiritual regeneration is more important than physical have a something worse will happen to you because you know if you're not going to change your inner self your all your sins and all this repent and all you know your eternal damnation will happen and that is worse than just a disease or anything like that so jesus tells him you know do that well i can't go into every verse now but definitely read this it's so beautiful because now this man goes back to the uh, authorities and says it was that man jesus and what a thing betraying jesus here he's got healing and now he puts jesus in a situation when well, jesus they question jesus 
And Jesus says, they said, how can you tell, break the law like this? And Jesus says, my father is working on the Sabbath and so will I. Now, what is Jesus doing? He is making himself the son of God. He is talking of God as his father. And for them, this is blasphemy. Nobody can make himself equal to God. So they are very, and he says, my father is working. Yes, he is working. All right. If you can do something good on the Sabbath, it's not the labor that you are doing. It is what, don't run after all worldly things, you know. Uh, don't uh, do things that are bothering about your job and all that. He says, do good. If you get an opportunity to do good, it's not the Sabbath that should stop you. Nothing should stop you from doing good. And that is what Jesus says. That everything is going on. Sunrises are happening. Everything. My father is, works on the Sabbath. He lets this world run. He is doing good on the Sabbath. So I'm also doing working on the Sabbath, healing this man. For them, they were really bothered because now Jesus is replacing another feast. Pay attention. Here he is replacing the Sabbath. And, you know, uh, in, it's not in John's gospel, but the other synoptic says he is Lord of the Sabbath. And he's replacing the Sabbath thing. That the Sabbath, he will be saying it in other things, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay, you need rest. So God gave this little time to rest. But that doesn't mean you cannot do good on that day. And he talks about God as his father. So this is one thing they will focus about. All right, not on the healing, but they are talking about the Sabbath. Next slide, please. So, you know, all those people were waiting for the moving of the water. They were waiting for some great emotional movement in their lives that will show them that God is calling them. They are waiting for a miracle to happen in times of need. Then we will answer. No? The same thing happens to all of us. Sometimes we are not making any progress in life because we are waiting. Like that man, 38 years, he was waiting. But Jesus is there in front of you and he is calling you. Don't sit by the pool of despair. Move out. Move out in faith that your healer is calling you. Your God is calling you to greater things. So what are you waiting for? That man was waiting for 38 years and he still didn't believe. So read your gospel. Get on the path to believe. Next. Well, this brings us to the fourth sign. By the pictures, you all definitely have heard about this sign okay there's that boy we are seeing with five loaves and two fish this picture is telling us so much about this miracle and this is a very big miracle okay it's there in john chapter 6 1 to 15 well we see that jesus is there with his apostles and all the crowd have come to listen to him and jesus not only cares about Spiritual needs, cares about physical needs also. And he says, you know, these people must be hungry. Let's give them something to eat. So he calls Philip and he says, what do we do? And Philip, you know, is, uh, he's actually, it's mentioned there that he wants to test Philip. Jesus knows what he's going to do. After all, he was God. Remember that. So Philip will say that, you know, 200 denarii, that is, Half a year's wages wouldn't be enough to give these people even a small morsel. Just trying to tell you the magnanimity of the crowd. And this will tell you the magnanimity of the miracle too. This sign is going to point out to something greater. Well, Philip says that we cannot do it financially. He did all the calculation. And Philip was from Bethsaida. So Jesus is asking Philip, Tell me, maybe he'll know some shops around or whatever, you know, in that way. Philip thinks of it that way. But Andrew comes up and says, look at him. He's saying, you know, there's one boy over here, one small boy. And he's got two fish and five loaves of bread, barley bread. What is that among such a big crowd? 5,000 men, women, all this, more than 5,000. Because they say 5,000 men. So there must have been women and children because we know 
more of the people who attend all this are always women. Well, Jesus says, give it, bring it. Because for Jesus, he has to work his miracle and he can't, he needs something to work this miracle. So remember, Jesus is asking for something. He asks us. We might think that we have nothing. Like these apostles, they thought they had nothing. But here this little boy is giving his meal. And from this little, this nothing, Jesus is going to make so much more. So much. He will take this and feed everyone. Okay? All right. Now, when we, as I open uh, you out to this beautiful miracle, Jesus will take this and he says something very beautiful. He takes this a little bit that this boy has offered through Andrew and he will take it and he will look up and say the blessing and then he will give it up. He took, he blessed, he said the blessing, he gave thanks and then he distributed. Have you heard these words before? Took, he gave thanks and said the blessing and then gave it to his disciples. No, he gives it to be distributed. We've heard this yes at mass because this is the sacramental theme, all right? That uh, we will be seeing in the next slide. So remember, if we offer nothing to God, then God has nothing to use to change our lives. So give the little that you have. All right, next slide. So even though that boy was so young, that age is not a barrier. Give what you have to our Lord and see what he does with it. Well, this miracle, this sign points out to something greater. It will point out to the Eucharistic banquet when there's abundance. Because John will actually use the word Eucharistio. That is to give thanks. From there we get the word Eucharist. All right. If you, of course, our Bibles are in English, but if you will see, he is using this word Eucharistio. And uh, Jesus distributes the bread as he will at the Last Supper. And later, Jesus will give us this bread saying, This is my body. So, this is a prequel, the you know, preview of the Last Supper and of what is going to happen at our everyday Mass. This is where. Jesus actually starts introducing us to the Eucharist. All right. Now, Jesus asked them to collect all the fragments. At Mass, you must have seen Father after communion, you know, he's, he's cleaning and he puts everything in. No, not a grain is lost. Nothing is lost. Okay. Because he will use that word klasma. All right. Which is a technical name for the host. Nothing should be lost. Whoever Jesus nourishes cannot be lost. Nothing should be lost. So he tells them, and look at the abundance. 5,000 people fed from those five loaves and two fish. 5,000. And then he says, collect it. They will get 12 baskets. One for each apostle, I would say. You know, 12 baskets remaining. Nothing should be wasted. That is the beautiful thing about Jesus's food miracles. We have seen Jesus has now shown us two signs with food miracles. One with wine and one with the bread. Well, we have seen bread and wine are the elements that are there in our Holy Eucharist. So every time we go for communion, let us remember this miracles, this these signs. Next, well, are you ready? To give your two fish and five barley loaves. Give your gift to God and God will use it. There's nothing too little for him that he can't do it. Okay, give your gift. The little you can do for your community. It's your gift to God and see what a big difference it will make. It will be just one person that you might be helping. But God will use you in a mighty way and multiply this Sign points us that God is a God of multiplication. 
he can multiply he can change substance he can multiply bread and fish that it can become plenty and abundant well the next slide we come to the fifth sign jesus walks on water well john in chapter 6 this is a miracle that is happening back to back just now he did one miracle and now it is another miracle in the 24 hour frame all right it is mentioned only in john that these people who ate they wanted to make him a king and uh, they they don't want to make him a king because he's a messiah but they wanted because he they realized what a great miracle this was and they said he's a prophet all right and they want to make him king but jesus we are told he tells his apostles to go go uh, they have to take the boat and go on that sea of galilee all right to capernaum and here we will see another miracle happening jesus goes up to pray you know uh, some i had read somewhere that uh, jesus realized they want to make him king he knows how not to take the honor but as apostles you know they might have just vast in this and taken but jesus knows what he has to do before all this happen before his glory so he goes up to pray and he sent his apostles away in case they get carried away with all this fanfare right and uh, next slide please yeah now we will see the divine identity of jesus till now we've seen him changing substance him healing from a distance well as you are looking there look at the words in yellow again i told you he brings that theme of darkness and light i told you the dark and light jesus is the light of life and a christless life is darkness so here they mention it is now dark Now these were fishermen. They knew the sea. They knew to judge the, you know, whether the weather, so to say. So when they are out, they have gone quite a distance. Huh? They have started. They are quite a distance, and Jesus realized that they are rowing, and there is a strong wind. This place is known for storms. There is a storm blowing, and they had rowed about three to four miles. So it's quite a distance. right now it was dark and jesus had not yet come to them because unless jesus comes there will not be light enlightenment and there they will see him walking on water this is the sign that shows that jesus is the god he has got control of nature jesus can control nature all right he not only is walking on the waters but they get frightened and he is revealing his identity we know no we heard of the great i am no i am was the name of god so we see a derivative of i am it is i they were so frightened and he said do not be afraid well all of us in life have this we've got to remember these words do not be afraid it is i i am with you till the end of time and here's what jesus is saying and the beautiful thing of this is once jesus gets into the boat the storm is calmed but you know right from old right from the beginning you know uh, we've seen that water was a symbol of chaos you know, we've seen it in noah, in noah then we've seen it uh, you know when moses that sea was stopping him from going to the promised land and that's why they parted waters when we look at it in that light we will see here jesus using this storm using water so to say like to put all their troubles underneath his feet so to say right so he gets into the boat and the storm is calmed that is what jesus when he is in our boat we should not be afraid of the storm jesus in our boat we can smile in the storm that is what happens and then another miracle they feel they have just reached the store their destination that's what he gets you to their de your destination next slide
Well, next slide, please. We come to the sixth sign, and the sixth sign is the healing of the man born blind. Next. This is in chapter nine. Well, here is a man that is blind from birth. All right. And Jesus' apostles are walking with him and they ask him, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? Because they believe that uh, you are born blind, you know, because of some sin, either yours or... But Jesus says, no, he's born blind because the glory of God has to be seen now. And he takes spit and mud and he puts it on this man's eyes, some substance, because sometimes we need, no, we feel if we take medicine, ah, we'll get all right. We need to see something. So Jesus has taken and saliva is supposed to have healing powers. I know that. So he puts this on this man's eyes and tells him, go to that pool of Shalom, right? Go there and wash. And this man, imagine he had to struggle up and get to that pool. But this man obeys. And when he obeys, as we see, he can see again. And he's so happy that, you know, his neighbors, there are four reactions over here. First, his neighbors will see him and say, Hurry, he was born blind. So they will look with surprise and a little bit of skepticism. How can this happen to him? Then, of course, after that, they will take him to the Pharisees, the authority. And they will ask, who cleared you? And this man said, uh, that, you know, this man called Jesus, at least he knew who cured him. Huh? That other man at uh, Bethesda did not know. This man knew. He said, this man called Jesus cured me. And then he will say a prophet. He's a prophet when they start asking him. And last, when he meets Jesus again, they put him out of the synagogue. Because they are saying, oh, what do you think? You are greater than us and all. How can this man do this again? It's the Sabbath when he is cured. So again, they feel that this man cannot be a prophet because he's breaking the Sabbath. This man said, I don't know what you think. All I know is I got cured. I was blind and I can see again. And that is what this man, his response is total gratitude. He will call Jesus when he meets Jesus again, he will call him Lord. So you see, first he will say this man named Jesus. Then he says a prophet. And then he says, Lord. So all the responses are showing us that his understanding of Jesus is growing and growing with each step. And that is what will happen in our lives too. As we go on encountering him through his word, through people, our understanding of him will also grow till in the end we will say, a Lord. Next slide, please. Well, we come to the seventh sign that is the last of the signs of year in this book of signs. And now there Jesus showed that he can heal uh, a person's body that had, uh, he regenerated his eyes, so to say. So it's something very beautiful in the previous one to see that even though one day we, we might be diseased, no? sometimes we have sicknesses, Jesus can heal. Heal our body, cell by cell, heal our skin, heal our organs. And even when we die, he can restore us, regenerate, recreate us, so to say, bring us back to life. So we shouldn't be fearing because he'll give us eternal life. Now we come to actually a climax where Jesus says, no, I've come to give life, life and light, as I told you. Here we will see how he is the master of life and death. Now, in this story, next slide, this is the climax of it all. We will see this is the scene at Bethany. All right, there was a family that were very close to Jesus, and Jesus was close to them. He would often uh, meet them. We've heard this Martha and Mary, two sisters. Well, their brother's name was Lazarus, and they were very close friends of Jesus. But, you know, Lazarus fell ill and Martha sends for Jesus. Now, Jesus is in a town called Perea, which is about a two day journey away. And she sends a message to go and call him because she knows he's a, he is the Messiah. He know, she knows that. So she says, go and call him. He can definitely do something. But, uh, you know, by the time the message goes, sadly, uh, this brief sickness of uh, Lazarus, 
is stronger than the available medicine, so to say, and he dies. You know, Jesus waits for two days before he sets out to Bethany. And uh, well, death doesn't wait. Jesus waited. But you know, it seems that uh, Jesus is late at times, but he's always on time. It may seem like he's late, but he comes there and there is Lazarus death as usual. Martha will run out because Mary is a quiet one. She sits reflective one. Martha says, where were you? If you would have come, my brother wouldn't have died. And uh, Jesus says, the brother is not dead. Okay, they asked him for what? You know, when his apostles had asked him, why you're delaying? He said, something that you will see the work of our Lord, of God. You're going to witness something. And then Jesus asked, where is he buried? And she says, they show him the place. And you know, there's a beautiful verse. I like you all to pay attention. It's in chapter 11, verse 35. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. It says, he wept. Can you imagine? Jesus weeps for his friend when his friend died. First of all, he's weeping for the consequences of sin because sin brings death into the world. But he's also showing his humanity. You know, so much you care about your friend and your friend has died. He wept. This shows us so much about the divinity and the humanity of Jesus. Then he prays. He prays not because he knows that he can do it. He knows he can do it, but he's praying that everybody else has to witness this. And he says, Lazarus, come out. They say, Lazarus, he has been dead for four days in the tomb. He must be decayed by now, smelling. How can he come out? But he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out. Quite frightening. I wish you all could see it in a movie, but we wouldn't, I couldn't get it across here. But there you can see the picture of Lazarus coming out bound in all the burial clothes. And his sisters were so much. Just imagine their brother who was dead has come to life. Well, your Jesus has shown he's the master of death and life. But Lazarus has come out with his burial clothes because Lazarus will die again. All right. Jesus, you know, in, uh, next slide, please. When he asked her she said yeah i know my brother will rise my brother will rise on the last day but jesus said i am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live even though he dies and then she believes you saw there are people who believe and disbelieve well when they see lazarus coming out because he comes out with those uh, burial robes because again he will need them to be buried again well as when we will see now in the resurrection Jesus leaves when he is buried, he will leave his burial robes behind because he doesn't need them. So he tells Lazarus, and now this is the sign that seals his life. Because now some people go and tell it to the authorities and now this is a sign that they cannot take because they are scared now and they want to kill him. So this seals his fate now. They are ready to make him die. So a resurrection leads to his death actually. Now he's on the road now to the book of glory, so to say. All right. So let's recap very quickly now. Next slide, please. We will see all the seven, the wedding at Cana, the healing of the, uh, of the official son, the healing at Bethesda, all the, all the seven. All right. Seven of those signs that point out that Jesus, next slide please, is the Messiah, giving you the identity. Jesus is being revealed. He reveals himself. Yeah, these signs confirm that Jesus has power, next slide, has power to alter substance, power over time. He's not limited by geographical distance. He can terminate disease, dispel false tradition. Multiply good things, control the elements, nature, recreate the body. And most importantly, he can bring the dead back to life. And Lazarus was not the only person he brought back to life. There was uh, the widow of Nain's son, which is in the synoptics. And there was also Jairus' daughter. And each of them was in a different state of being 
dead. Jairus' daughter had just died. Widow's son was going for his funeral and Lazarus was in the tomb for so many days. So you see, it doesn't matter how dead you are or how long you've been dead. Jesus can definitely bring you back to life. A pun intended. Okay, He does can bring us back to life because he is our omnipotent Lord, our divine God who is all-powerful. Next slide. Well, it doesn't end with the seven sign because I'm talking many scripture scholars, not only me. They say the eighth sign, which is not in the book of signs, but it is in the gospel of John, is the resurrection. Because now Jesus will prove that, you know, Lazarus died again. He dies. But Jesus will prove that he is beyond death. He's the first fruits from the dead. And now he will be resurrected. Death cannot hold him any longer and he will come to eternal life. Many of us put emphasis on the death of Christ when we neglect his resurrection. The early church took the resurrection very seriously because the resurrection proves that he has conquered death. Otherwise, if he didn't rise, they would have said, just one good man, he died, okay, fine. But now he proved that whatever he said, that I am the life, I, you know, even if you die, you will live. He showed that beyond death, there is life. And for us all, we are so happy because we all know that beyond our death, there is life. You know, I like to think when I die, that, you know, the next conscious thing that I would hear is the voice of, like how he called Lazarus come out. I would love to hear the voice of my Jesus saying, Shamin, Shamin, come, come forth, come out. That is the beautiful thing that calling me. Well, this is the cornerstone of the preaching of the early church, the resurrection. Okay, it showed that Jesus is what he said he was. He is the life. Next slide, please. Well, as I told you, all these signs are to make you believe. All right? The law said do, but grace is given so that you believe. And can you see that beautiful thing? That man is carrying that heavy burden. Now he is light. All right? And he can put down that burden because the Son of God has come to give us grace. And that's what we would like to say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Well, today I know we have come to the end of our class. Next slide, please. We may have, I don't know whether I brought you all to believe, but you all have got your Bibles in your hands. Read it up, especially now in this lockdown. Read up your Bibles. Because, you know, at any time, while reading about these eight signs, and, you know, God puts it in your heart and mind to believe in him. Then, you know, just do it. Believe in him. Tell God, I believe in you. Actually, he'll already know. Tell others how you believe in Christ. Because I can tell you that this decision that you take to believe in him will be the most valuable work that you can do for yourself. In your life just believe because next slide please because in Christ now we can become a new creation the most beautiful prayer that you can say is I believe help my unbelief it's a short it's a Bible verse I believe help my unbelief because that is the purpose of John's gospel that is the purpose of the seven signs that is the purpose of Jesus to say that you believe and you can get eternal life because that's what he's come to give you life and life to the fullest because he loves you. So we come to the end of the class, everyone. We will end now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, dear Lord. Help us believe because we believe, Lord. But sometimes... There is a little bit of unbelief. Lord, help us through that. Let me learn to believe in you. Let me learn to believe you, Lord. Love you and serve you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goodbye, children. Goodbye and God bless everyone.